Well, hello, everybody. Thanks again for starting your weekend with us at Bookish, the virtual program on authors, thinkers, and the literary life produced by the Southern California News Group. I'm Sam Dunn. I'm the senior editor of Premium Content here. And I want to say thank you again to all of our Reader Reward subscribers and really all of you who come back month after month to, to support our programs. And hey, if you are a Reader Rewards member attending tonight, you're automatically entered to win a 50 $50 gift certificate to our partner and one of our favorite indie bookstores, Once Upon a Time Bookstore in Montrose. And, you know, if you're not a subscriber yet, why aren't you a subscriber? Please go to scng.com forward slash subscribe to find your local paper. And hey, very exciting news. Also check out our new bookish swag. You can grab some online. Show your book nerd pride there. Yeah. Sandra and I have shirts. So does our production manager. Get yours too. Hey, uh, just a reminder before we get going, if you've got questions, please enter it in the Q&A section on your toolbar. And if you just want to connect with other audience members, use the chat feature found at the bottom of your toolbar as well. And don't worry about missing anything from today because a recording of the show is going to be sent to you so you can share or just revisit some of your favorite moments. It's also posted at scng.com forward slash virtual events. And that's where you can find all of our past virtual shows as well as see what's coming up. And now it's my pleasure to call in our host, Sandra Singlo. You've heard her on NPR's Morning Edition on This American Life and on Marketplace. She also hosts the syndicated radio minute, The Lowdown on Science. She's a contributing editor at The Atlantic. And wait, she's also the author of seven books, including The Mad Woman and the Roomba. She's also an amazing performer, performer, excuse me, and has been crazy busy with her phenomenal new show, Mad Women of the West. It's sold out here in Los Angeles, and I hear it's moving to off-Broadway soon. So welcome, Sandra. Hello. 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 Okay, I'm looking in my messy living room. Um, I hope that you're Hello. enjoying my outfit. Um, so today our theme is romance, as we'll talk about. My mother, I think as yours, was a big enjoyer of romance novels. So I threw on a scarf in her honor of kind of, I feel like I'm like her, a romance novel fan. We would have a scarf and her glasses. Sexy, and my, willing to take on the world. My historical home that's now, actually I'm decluttering, so ignore that behind me. But um, anyway, but you don't look like you're in your usual horse barn. No, I'm not in my barn office. I'm actually at a wedding. My nephew is getting married this weekend. So we're right before the rehearsal dinner. Very romantic around here. So right. Yes, and it's a here. very romantic weekend because tomorrow, August 19th, is yes. the what the fourth annual the what's what is what, it called books why am i blanking for romance books for, books for romance day the book section of our newspapers have reported on this it's an, an it's a really fun initiative between independent bookstores and the romance community readers and writers celebrating this really vibrant section of the literary world so yay yeah. that's tomorrow august 19th and in our fourth year of bookish also, it's like sometimes there's a debate between high literary books <laughs> and genre books, you know, genre to mystery, thriller and romance. And, and sometimes like romance is, I like to say, not shortlisted, but short shrifted. I hope you enjoyed that <laughs> linguistic wordplay. Um, but people don't take it seriously. However, they are wrong because what the book sales for romances are. Incredible. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, B romance novels are essentially propping up the entire book industry at this point, literary fiction included. Just this year alone, 39 million copies have been sold. That's a 52% increase from previous years. So everyone needs love, wants love, and uh, is reading love. So let's get to it. So fantastic. Uh, we'll, we'll get to our books about love. We have two today, and I think it's, it's a wonderful package for you. If you have want. fun. Bye-bye. All right. First off, we have the wonderful Sarah McLean. Now, New York Times, and here's the 30-second download. New York Times, Washington Post, and USA Today bestseller Sarah McLean is the author of historical romance novels translated into more than 25 languages. The books that make up the McLeanaverse are beloved by readers worldwide. If you're new to Sarah's work, um, just savor some of these fun titles. 
a rogue. I'm not going to do my scarf when I do this. A rogue by any other name. One good earl deserves a lover. No good duke goes unpunished. And the last but not the least, rule of four, a Scott in the dark. I love it, a Scott in the dark. Uh, a columnist for the New York Times, Washington Post, and Bustle, Sarah's the host of the weekly romance podcast, Fated Mates. Her work in support of romance and those who read it earned her a place on Jezebel.com's Shiro's list and led Entertainment Weekly to call her the elegantly fuming, utterly intoxicating queen of historical romance. Welcome, Sarah. You, thank you. We, thank you so much for having me, Sandra. It's so and nice we really you expect too. you to elegantly fume. Whatever that is, <laughs> we want you to do it. Listen, that's just my zero state. So <laughs> <laughs> elegant fuming. Okay. So it's, you know, you are both, and and it, it said, you know, in, in addition to your novels, you're a leading advocate for the romance genre, which we're going to talk about so excitedly today. Um, speaking widely on its place as a feminist text and cultural bellwether. So for those new to your work who just think of romance as bodice rippers and what's wrong with bodice ripping, let's, you know, <laughs> so, and you can self bodice rip, another thing. Okay, so you're both a feminist and a mega best-selling romance novelist. Can you explain how that works? Um, I don't actually think that there's much cognitive dissonance in this. Um, the genre is, it's 50 years old. Um, the modern romance was birthed alongside second wave feminism, Gloria Steinem and Bell Hooks and so many other uh, really like well-known, well-respected lions of feminism are romance readers. And um, I'm really proud to, to write a genre that is celebrating uh, women and other people in the margins having joy, thriving, loving, finding partnership, um, and enjoying every second of it. Well, and it's sort of interesting, and, and you you were at Smith and also at Harvard, um, and I remember I spent six years in English literature grad school uh, and have no degree really to show for it, but the birth of the novel with Pamela and that like be began, they were all hero, women were all heroines of, of these books. Sure. I mean, the traditional romance, when you talk about romance from your perspective as an English literature scholar, um, romance is romance sort of as an idea in literature. Books that we would call traditional romances from, uh, you know, classical literature is not what we're talking about when we're talking about the modern romance novel, which requires a number of things that those sort of classic romances did not have, um, namely a woman not dying at the end after she's had sex and fallen in love. That's that's really the big Anna one. Anna Karenina, Madame Bovary, right, good. Right, we are not hit by trains in romance novels. We get yeah. to live happily ever after. Well Often the heroines are the trains that hit other people, which is great. And also exactly. as opposed to those, those traditional English romances, it's not like a maid in a house that gets hit on by the Lord and then hopefully she can marry up. I think sure. maybe that's what feels feminist about your book and, and book yeah, is that they're, absolutely. They, right? So maybe you can talk a little bit, for instance, about the heroine of your newest book, Knockout, because it's very colorful and fantastic. Yeah, so I'm currently writing a series that's set in Victorian England. It's called the Hell's Bell series. It's uh, based on a girl gang in history. Um, my girl gang is, uh, they are full of lady vigilantes who are <laughs> essentially um, driving their train, as you say, through the patriarchy. Um, and so, and and falling in love and living and thriving in the balance. The heroine of Knockout, which comes out on Tuesday, um, is Imogen Loveless, and she is an explosives expert. She is a scientist, and she is pure chaos. Um, and she is investigating a number of um, of explosions throughout the East End of London, uh, where uh, some bad men. Um, being paid by other very bad men are destroying uh, locations where people in need congregate. 
Um, so there's, you know, uh, women's health clinics and um, workers' rights organizations and halfway houses for women who are escaping, you know, terrible marriages and bad employers are finding safety and security in numbers and um, bad men are blowing them up and the uh, hell's bells won't stand for it. And so they are going to kick ass and destroy the patriarchy and these terrible men and fall in love in the balance and live happily ever after because isn't that what we all deserve? Yes, very fun to read. And also, I, I don't know why I'm feeling very historical, to, but but also in, in terms of class, again, the traditional classical romance, oh, I'm lower class and the Lord is upper class. In this case, Lady Imogen Lovelace, which is a mm -hmm. fantastic name. And look Thank you. You know, she she is of an aristocratic class. And so the love it the love duet is interesting. I mean, I think there's conversations about class in the book that are very interesting. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, we love a cross-class romance in general in society, right? I mean, it's sort of a universal pleasure center to see somebody, to see, you know, across the tracks romance and somebody, you know, really rise up. Um the hero of this book uh, is a detective inspector at Thomas at a, at Scotland Yard. He grew up in a in the East End of London in a not great neighborhood with a impoverished in an impoverished family. He is he believes in justice, um, but he has forgotten in many ways that justice is about uh, is not just about who can pay for it, um, in who can manipulate it. Justice is about um, if any if. For so many of us, justice is more about those people who need it without being able to pay for it. Um, and so there is obviously these books. Romance tells, I, you said cultural bell, bellwether. Um, it's a great word. It, it tells the story of the world that we're living in, even when you're me and writing books in the 19th century. Well, how so? How can you make that connection from then to today? Well, I mean... To be totally fair, in 2023, as we look at the world, as we look at um, women's rights, at bodily autonomy, at queer rights, at um, you know sexual identity, about at at book banning, at politics, at um, immigration, at unionizing, at workers' rights, these were battles that were being fought every day on the front lines in Victorian England. We have shockingly not moved the needle very much. Uh, I, I think, though, um, while that is happening in the book, and it's a fascinating read, it's very page turning, mm. it's fun. You. you also use the phrase, uh, what, what is it, like emotional pleasure center? Did you say something like Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and I, I think part of the joy of reading this also is, is that the conversations are fun, the people are fun, and um, it's not rated PG. Sarah. No, it is not. <laughs> no, it is not. So, and that's, it's so that those, okay. So those scenes are really fun to read. And I think it's interesting because if the topic is romance and it is, um, the push pull of, of who's seducing who mm -hmm. and who's pleasuring who. And I found that really interesting and exciting. Can you talk a little bit? Well, A, are those scenes fun to write? Because they're certainly fun to read and, and <laughs> not everyone can write a good sexy scene and, and you really do. And then do you Thank think, you. how much do you think about who's, who's pleasuring who or how the dynamics of the power work? Right. I mean, I'm so glad you said power because power is really the story of every relationship, not just in romance. Um, but if you think about every relationship in your whole life, um, power is at play, right? Who has power, how power shifts, um, how power in a, in a perfect relationship, platonic or romantic power is in constant negotiation, is in constant shift. Um, the reality is, is that uh, writing sex scenes is uh, not, uh, it's, it's not any more fun than writing any other scene. Uh, they still have to read well. Right. <laughs> um, it's, right. It still happens at this very desk in yoga pants. Um, and so it's not, it's not what you're imagining, I don't think. Um, but what I would say is that 
Um, sex in a romance novel is about um, intimacy, of course. It's about identity. It's about unpacking all the things that relationships um, give us, all the ways that relationships show us who we are and who we might be. And it's about hope. It's about writing um, an ideal, a world where we are able to achieve pleasure, to, um, to share pleasure, to negotiate pleasure without shame and to thrive because of it. Right. And I think that there, the play um, of vulnerability, uh, being vulnerable and then being powerful because you are vulnerable and then showing part of yourself as a sense mm -hmm. of intimate, like it is really, those are wonderful scenes to read. Um, yeah, there's a reason why we call sex intimate, right? Why why we use that word to describe the physical acts. Um, and that is because there is nothing more internally powerful than the connection between people in that moment. There, There's a rawness and a, a, a nakedness, I mean, in all forms, right? So um, to go back to your growing up a little bit, you have a very interesting bio. You have, uh, I, I, I've heard tell, an Italian father and an English mother, and there is a rumor, and you can dispel it or or prove it, um, your English mother who may or may not have worked for M16 as a spy. Yes, that's correct. That, that is that? not okay, a rumor. Just, it is the okay, truth. Okay, so you speak to that. And then when would you even find out if your mother was a spy? Can you tell, tell about um, that? Well, it's a really very fun story. And actually, my mom is currently in my house. And I'm sure we'll be delighted to know that you asked about her. We can't even um, see your mom. She's not going to lean in. Oh. <laughs> no, she's been expressly told to stay outside. Um, but... <laughs> Uh, yes, that is true. I discovered it when I was in um, high school. I was reading, uh, I was doing um, a project for a, a European history class, and I was reading about a very, very famous uh, situation where spies were involved in the Cold War. And I looked up from my project and from the kitchen table and I said, um, it, it, I think it'd be really fun to be a spy. And my mom was ironing. I remember this very clearly. My, you know, incredible mom was ironing and she looked up and deadpan said um actually there's a lot of paperwork and my mom does not tell jokes like this this is not my mom's form of humor and I was like mom that's so funny like what a weird way and she was like no I'm not making a joke like I I work for my six and uh and I may, you know, th this was like a shocking revelation. And the reality is that, you know, we always joke in the house that at some point the phone is going to ring and my mom's going to just like let it drop to the floor and like leave us forever because she'll be called home. Uh, but that is true. And and it's probably where I get most of my stories. Um, you know, my my parents had a really a global romance. Um, it spanned literal continents and uh when you grow up with that kind of story, uh, you can't really help but tell them yourself. Yeah, and so maybe that's your penchant for, yes, so, so your heroine, Lady Imogen, it, it, she's literally incendiary. Um, <laughs> and, and I think that's wonderful, uh, these strong women. And I love that, I, I think I called it M16 instead of MI6, because I have I have very little. It's really fine. British it's fine. Nobody's coming to your door, Sandra. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Not, not with a house this messy. No, um, my mom's here on the other side of the country, so you're safe. <laughs> so, but I also know that growing up, your sister, there's a reading of romance, not like that you were... Mm -hmm began as a voracious reader is that right and and that's how you got into yeah I mean you mentioned this in your introduction with Sam um so many of us come to romance um in a subversive community way and what I mean by that is um these are secret books that are passed down from mothers or grandmothers to daughters and and granddaughters and um they're my sister who is a decade older than me went off to college and underneath her bed were just dozens of romance novels and I found them and it was like coming home in so many ways like these were big explosive beautiful stories that where the emotions were all dialed up to 11 and the plots were propulsive I mean these are not lit you you referenced you know literary fiction versus genre fiction I mean these were not literary 
you know, slogs. These were not designed to read over, over months or years. These were designed to be read in hours. Um, and I was so caught up in the magic of this genre and in the stories of these women who claimed power and took what they wanted and made space for themselves in the world. And um, and the the men and and partners and friends who helped them claim that space. Uh, they were aspirational for me as a, you know, weird nerdy kid uh, in Rhode Island, and they continue to be aspirational for me as a weird nerdy adult, you know, in New York City. So, well, yeah, we it, it's a sisterhood, but I mean, now of course it's much broader than that. That's so interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm reflecting like, again, my mother, who's the, she would always wear a scarf. Uh, we were in Southern California, so she had a beach locker and all of her books read and reread Perfect. Secret Trove, except they were covered with suntan lotion and had sand in the pages, but the same kind of, and they were books that were this big and you could rip through really quickly. I mean, yeah. I think you have told a story of, um, I think it's checking out books in libraries and mm-hmm. seeing some oh you've stretching. done your research Sandra markings <laughs> in the back so oh, would you this tell our our uh, viewers that that's fascinating listen this is my very favorite thing it's my favorite story about romance um and I think it is really special about specifically for romance because as you said from the beginning there is this sort of we, those of us who have grown up reading romance and have had romance in our lives so much have spent so much time with the in the world with the world telling us that what we were reading was somehow less valuable than all these other books. Um, And we of course knew in our hearts that this wasn't the case that we were reading. There's power in joy. Joy is revolution. Joy is transformative. Happily ever after is a subversive act, right? It is a revolutionary act to choose happiness in the face of power. Because once you say, I choose to live happily, all power is stripped from people who wanna control you, right? I choose my happiness. Um, what's interesting about this, though, is that in in communities now with the internet, we're able to have these things. We, we're able to find our like-minded people and our and our communities online. But when you live in a small town in Rhode Island in the '90s and earlier, um, you end up at the library looking through the romance section. And um, you know, as many of you know, the covers look the way they look, the titles are the way they are. Um, and the books tend to sort of blend together, especially in an age of you know Fabio on every cover. What ended up happening though, was the women in my library system, and I'm told that this happens all over in libraries everywhere. So check your own library system for this, um, would check out these books and they would mark them with their own sort of personal hieroglyph, their little mark, a star or a dot or a you know red square. And it was to keep in it was to keep for themselves a record. I have read this book, right? Um, and then they would, if they loved it though, they would in the front, very discreetly on the front inside cover, would put a little exclamation point. And so you learned very quickly at this library in Lincoln, Rhode Island to take out the books that had the most exclamation points. And then soon you become brave enough to add your own, right? Romance gave us voice even in this time when we did not have a voice. We couldn't, you know, we weren't being interviewed by journalists about the power of the genre. We were just sharing the power within us. That's so fantastic. And I think that you've talked about, you're a real advocate for um, romance novels for the form, but really there are so many different kinds of romance. It's not just, as you say, Fabio, which makes me laugh hilarious. So you used to have a life-size right. cut of Fabio. Uh, yes, as- I'm sorry. I just have to beam in for a minute. Let's <laughs> have stories Hi, about Fabio. I have stories, well, I will I tell bet you, you do. off screen. <laughs> I, I, hope, I hope they're not all G-rated, Samantha. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so there's Fabio, you know, and the traditional, but but I think that, for instance, you know, Lady Image and Loveless is kind of like, it's it said, you know, it's kind of like she loves that Thomas Peck can sweep her up because she's not light as a fat. I mean, she's petite right. and adorable, but she's not a conventional kind of like wispy, right. uh, she's you know. plus you know, size, yeah. She's plus size. And I think that you, you've said that there's romances today for, you know, all different kinds of For different everyone. Communities. Right. I mean, I say all the time that, you know, whatever your kink, romance 
has it. And I don't just mean kink in the formal way. I mean, um, there are, you know, my, my friend Tessa Bailey, who probably many of your readers are familiar with, likes to say, the best thing about romance is that you can wake up in the morning and think to yourself, who do I want to be today? And you can read that life in happiness and triumph. And that is incredibly powerful for so many of us because representation matters. We know that. Yes. And I think, well, here's a question you can answer. Like you are, you, you are married and you have a family. Just yes. when you write these amazing books about London and the 1800s mm-hmm. and the rogues and scoundrels and dukes and ladies setting off bombs and stuff like that. I think at the end of the book or Walt, do you take away or learn something that you take in your own relationships or do you use something out of your own marriage and put in the book? It's a very personal question. I mean, it's a little of both, right? I mean, I think um, the books are, I said earlier, romance has always been aspirational for me. Um, And it continues to be aspirational for me. All of my heroines have characteristics that are a little bit Sarah and a lot what Sarah wishes she could be um, and how Sarah wishes she could move through the world, how Sarah wishes she could take up space in in the world. Um, That's what I write because that's the kind of heroine I'm looking I'm looking to to spend time with. Right. And I I have to spend eight months with all these women. Right. So, um, you know, what of my life ends up in the books? Literally everything. I mean, conversations, events, my 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 uh, brother spent a a lot of time over the last year playing with invisible ink with my my daughter and that you know found its way into knockout because you know you we write the worlds that we live in and we write you know and that's true of we write the problems of the world that we live in and we we watch our characters tackle them and win we write uh ourselves we write the characteristics we want in ourselves and the people around us in the characters that we are giving happily ever after to. And, um, and when you write historicals, especially, you know, there is such joy in that research. I have never in all my time writing, and I've read, this is my 19th book. I have never had an idea that I couldn't find evidence of in the world. And that's a big piece of the puzzle for me because I write books where beautiful people blow things up in 1840 and um, beautiful people have been blowing things up. Women have been smashing the patriarchy. Men have been standing by their side and lifting them up um, for millennia. And so these are the stories that come back again and again for me and for my readers. Yeah, and I think that's fun to note. And I'm hoping that your brother did not eat lamb every night. <laughs> like, like in He the did not, <laughs> point of order, I think lamb is gross. <laughs> It seemed like that was coming across, but I think that there, it is ingenious because she is a scientist and is putting together these these different concoctions to make these explosives. And so your re, it, it, so research is part of what you enjoy, and you do it in the library. Like, how, how do you? What's the world of how you research? Well, unfortunately, over the last couple of years, yeah, I've done it in the library. I've done it in my home with you know the help of really remarkable librarians and specialists from the New York Public Library and also the the British Library. Um, But I would say that, you know, there is no kind of research for Victorian London, like trips to London are research for Victorian London. Um, But what I would say is that I'm currently, I said I was um, writing a a girl gang right now and um, she, and the bells are based on a real life um, Victorian girl gang uh, called the 40 Elephants. It was the largest shoplifting ring ever in the history of the United Kingdom. Um, And it was entirely peopled by women. Um, And they were incredible. Um, They 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 built their own they put special garments so that they could move in and out of stores and like shoplift heavily. Uh, Their first queen, the heads of the 40 elephants were called the queens. Their first queen was arrested for falsifying documents to work in a munitions factory. Who knows what she was going to blow up? Um, But I'm sure it was going to be something that was really bad. (laughs) Um, and then the final queen was buried in a six thousand dollar dress in from Herod's, stolen from Herod's in the nineteen sixties. So, um, you know, 
these women were, and these women though criminals were using um, the way the world treats women and misjudges women uh, for their own gain. These were largely women who were born in the South, on you know, on the South Bank of, of the Thames and on the East End of London um, and didn't have power or privilege uh, and so had to claim it for themselves. And, and Revolution, is, right? Yeah, it, it, that's so fascinating. And and it, it's fascinating to learn and that sometimes those stories aren't entirely told, but you are telling versions of these and it's a very exciting history. So thank you so much. I, um, I have a quick question for Sarah, if I yes, may. Yes. Lady boss. Shoot. Sarah, I, I just love everything you had to say. I'm sure everyone at home loves it too. I was in, intrigued when I was doing a little bit of research on the numbers for uh, romance sales to mm -hmm. find that there's a huge young audience, right? Yes. Young readers are driving this. What is that about for you? And why do you think that young women, it seems more than ever, are are finding these gems? Um, I don't know that it's more than ever. I think they're more uh, comfortable about yeah. talking about it than ever. Yeah. I think young women particularly, but young people in the world, I think struggle, of course, with identity. We know this from when we were young, right? Um, right. You struggle to understand your place in the world. You struggle to understand who your people are and how you will find a way to thrive. And I think the world often disdains young people and disdains um, the, the choices that we make as young people to choose happiness, to choose ourselves in a lot of ways. But when you're young, like that is the, that is the work to figure out your space. And mm -hmm. romance is about that. It is about finding your space and your people and your partner and your future and knowing that happily ever after is coming. There will be high highs. There will be low lows. If you're reading a McLean book, I'm going to rip your heart out and stomp on it. But ultimately you're gonna be okay and everyone's gonna live happily ever after. And that is a great promise and really compelling for young people. And me, I'm not young. <laughs> Don't even start with that girl. Listen, <laughs> listen thank you. I, 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 I'm out of words. Thank you so, so much, Sarah. Really. It was a real joy. Thank you so much. Stay safe, Southern California. I'm watching you from the East Coast. Um, yeah, and, comes and out next good thoughts. week knockout it's fantastic tuesday tuesday oh, tuesday thanks come back yeah. sarah i will anytime okay Take thank care. you bye. bye well what i didn't say uh that i should have probably said was that judith Crant when when she was talking about how young people find their place in the world a judith Krantz novel changed my life Literally, I read it when I was 16. It gave me a uh, a roadmap for the rest of my life. So she's- Which, was it Scruples? Yes, of course it was Scruples. <laughs> so now there was another one that my mom had in her famous beach locker. And I forget the name, oh, Dazzle. It was Dazzle. Oh, Dazzle. And you didn't see it, but but it's kind of like the heroine's name was Jazz Kill Cullen. Oh my gosh. Jeff. I mean, they, all the heroines were wearing cat suits. Oh How come scruples changed your life? Oh, because it was a powerful woman with a, with a man's name, like Sam. Billy was her name. Sam was mine. And she was an unattractive girl who changed her life by going to Paris and came back to become a, a powerful, successful woman in California. I, I don't know. I mean, just gave me so, something of a roadmap. Not that I have achieved it, but it, it gave me a place to go from a trailer park in New Mexico. Hey, Sarah, if you're still on, don't leave because we have a question for you from one of our audience members um, who wants to know what were those little sticky uh, post-its post -its behind you? Are you still there? Can you beam back in? <laughs> I'm, Sorry, I'm still here. About. Yes, I'm so glad because now <laughs> it's haunting me. Because, yes, <laughs> what's up? <laughs> Uh, this is, uh, the outline for a project, that, a book that I'm working on right now. So, Ooh. yeah. <laughs> we feel but so there it is. I'm too, too bad. The magic of in. it. And look, my I know, that's season. why I do, it's fine. <laughs> the fa my favorite season is the fall of the patriarchy. Fantastic. <laughs> that's what that says. That's yeah. my just general vibe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank so. you so much. Well, well 
thank you all so much for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> Sorry, you. we usually don't do this callback. As it turns out, Andrew uh, Greer, Andrew Sean Greer, who was supposed to be our next guest, had something befall him and he can't jump on Zoom. So it's oh, no. just those chickens, but thank you so much for sticking around and saying, talking as long as you have. Thank you. Good night. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Sandra, sorry. Okay. This Life. is this is the this is the high wire act of a live show. Our guest. It is it, it is indeed, and we are live. So, um, but you know, I think we got a lot. Uh, just contemplating the sex part is alone. It's it's a weekend, and then we have these torrid hurricanes coming on Sunday and Monday. So it's really a perfect opportunity to just it, settle it inside with the fun. It is. But before before we move on to to our books editor, Eric, telling us what we've got coming up in in the newspapers in terms of books coverage, you loved Andrew Sean Greer. I just wanted you to say a little bit about Les. Yeah. So uh, Andrew Sean Greer is won the Pulitzer Prize in 2018 for his novel Less. And it's a comic novel, which is so fantastic because often prizes are won for war and blindness and hatred and whatever. Oh. And I think I, I had a friend who used to say, you know, the, the magazine for women over 40 is more. The magazine for men over 40 should be less, which is hilarious. Um, <laughs> and so it's about a, a gay writer, a white gay male writer of about 50 whose old lover he gets an invitation to uh, to, to the, his old lover's wedding and it is so hard for him to face that he decides to take every horrible literary event book invitation he gets because he's very mid listy like some of us can relate to that not actual Andrew Shandru but the but the character Andrew Less um and just take go for a year and take every terrible book invite and every horribly paying whatever just to avoid going to this wedding so it's absolutely hilarious and I think that it, it's kind of has put uh, puts one in mind of Vladimir Nabokov, not Nabokov, ah. Nabokov, I should say, not like the Sting sing, sings in the police song. And I think the language is really precise, really hilarious. And it's wonderful to see that Pulitzer Prizes can be won by comic novels that just speak to the human condition in this incredibly beautiful way. And the, the, set, the book um, that came out after that is Less is Lost. And it's a follow-up where he gets on an RV and goes across country again. So it's really um, both, I, I recommend both books. And um, and it's also, we would have had the back-to-back -back of S straight romance, which Sarah writes about. And this is actually gay, gay romance, which is interesting, particularly there's uh, you know speculation on youth of being a young gay man, and then what even is a middle-aged gay man, and then how can you be an old gay man about how that works in in gay and and so it's also a fascinating read as well. And those would be our back-to-back -back romance books. Love it, and and less is lost comes out in paperback, uh, or yes. is is just out in paperback. Uh, yeah. So that's a good thing for everybody to know. Well, yes. listen, this was fabulous, and thank you as always, and Sarah was ah, Sarah loved her so much ba -doom, also, ba -doom. yeah oh so incredible also I have to as always thank our production manager Julie Corlett who is the Oz behind the curtain and makes everything happen uh as Sarah said before we jumped on truly the most important person on the show um folks don't forget to uh, copies of today's books are available at Once Upon a Time Bookstore. And if you'd like to share your thoughts from today, if you have suggestions or any additional questions, or you want to say anything at all, and please e email us at events at scng.com. Yes? Were you and say it's something? fun that I finally get to see Eric's end notes, which I think I missed the last time. So Yes, we're going to yes. do that. And oh, next time, everybody, join us next month because we've got a really special show. We've got the Goldberg brothers, Lee Goldberg and Todd Goldberg who are crime mystery writers, write very differently, but in the same genre. And then we we have Jesus Trejo, the comedian, talking about his uh, first uh, children's book. He's going to be headlining the Orange County Children's Book Festival in October too. So anyway, without further ado, let's get to Eric, talk about what's what we've got coming up.
Yes. Oh, please tell me that's please tell me that's going to work. Yes, here it is. Yay. Thank you, Sam and Sandra. Um, I want to let people know that in this weekend's uh, print paper, they can read Sam's interview with Karen Slaughter, uh, the author of After That Night and uh, many other books. It's really it's terrific. Uh, I got to edit the piece and so I got to read it first. And I think you'll really enjoy it. It's great to see Sam um, talking to other writers as she does here. Uh, we've also got an interview with Eden Lepucky. Her new book, Time's Mouth, is out. It's great. It's got cults. It's about California. Uh, and she talks about magical babies. And who doesn't love a magical baby? Um, beyond that, we've also got uh, I Will Greet the Sun Again, an interview with the author of that. He's a debut uh, author. We've also got... If you haven't read it, um, a piece that ran last week about Hollywood signs, uh, some of the classic signs around L.A., and also a list uh, you can find online if you didn't see it in the paper uh, of great signs that you can still see today. It's it's a terrific kind of combo of classic and not classic. Um, beyond that, uh, you can read the book pages this week. I'm talking about uh, some things I saw in New York, some bookstores, and also a book I was reading, which has been out for a little bit and we've talked about, but I finished reading this, uh, the new Dennis Lehane book uh, this week, and boy, what a good book that is. So if you're looking for a good book, that's my recommendation this week. Uh, thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. <laughs>